Well, we've had a good uh, worship experience already, haven't we? Now you're sitting there saying, well, I hope this preacher can preach. <laughs> I uh, was invited to preach at First Baptist Church, Florala, Alabama. Anybody know where that's at? Well, it's on the border between Florida and Alabama. That's why they call it Florala, about Florala. And uh, if you ever wondered what was going on when a preacher and, and song leader or somebody talks to each other, well, I was up there and... and uh, the song leader, uh, and I was talking, and he, um, he seemed kind of like he just um, wasn't sure about how things were going. We were in the middle of the offertory, and Teddy Avery turns to me, and he says, um, something you might want to know. I said, well, I want to know something. And he said, what's that? I said, I want to know how you can call somebody to preach for you you've never heard before. What makes you think I can preach? He said, it don't make no difference. <laughs> and by the way, you're on the radio and the train comes through at noon. So let me fill you in right now. That thing don't work and there's no time up there. Did y'all know that, that that used to have a time in the bottom corner for the preacher? He never paid attention to it, but it had some time up there. In two days, we'll be celebrating our independence. And we all put different kinds of meanings to that. I really wonder, had our forefathers been forewarned or had known or had that, that knowledge of what it would be like for us when they were struggling for independence for us. Uh, I really find it interesting that they were complaining because they were taxing the tea. Folks, we get taxed for everything. And then they tax the money that we buy everything with. So had they been, had some foreknowledge, had they been insightful, or if some way or another they'd received some information, then they could have known that if they had become the uh, country that they became, what would happen to you and me? We'd be taxed for everything including tea. But aren't we glad we're free? And aren't we really thankful that we had people who would be willing to keep us free? If we could have known about, if, if our forefathers could have known about things that would have affected us and done something about it. I suspect that your president, George Washington, probably would have been a dentist. See, when he was working on those wooden teeth of his, if he had just known what dentists get paid and how often they, the appointment is set for so long, huh, he'd have probably not been president at all. He'd been more likely a dentist. We see in our text in Acts chapter 1, and, uh, the, Luke is writing to Theophilus. And, and Luke is, is trying to tell him that in his former letter to him, he says, I've told you everything about Jesus Christ, including up until his death. And then, that's verses 1 and 2, and then he says to him, he says, but I have some more to tell you. It seems that he has, after his resurrection, appeared many times to many people. And he's appeared to his disciples. And then that brings me to verse 6, where you see that the disciples are gathered with Jesus. 
This is Jesus' last day on the earth after his resurrection. And his disciples are, are coming to him and their question which they ask is, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, it would be wonderful if we could know that. They thought it was important information that they should have. Do you know that if you knew that a hurricane this year would take out your house, that you probably wouldn't stay there? If you knew, say several years ago, that stocks were going to go down, you probably wouldn't have left your money where you left it. If you had known that you were going to suffer this illness because of something you did in an earlier time in your life, you probably would have done something about it. If we could just know what it is we would like to achieve in our life, and know that it will come out the way we want it to, we could prepare ourselves. When we're told a hurricane comes, some of us prepare. Other of us prepare to leave. Others of us prepare to party. Now, I never understood that concept at all. Uh, my wife wants to go to a, a shelter. I want to take her to see her mother. She feeds real good. All that home growing stuff. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, just after harvest is hurricane. And so now she knows why I want to go see her mother. If we had the foresight to know that we could be well by doing something, we'd probably do it. But the problem is, is we don't know when we're going to get sick. So what I'm trying to give you is, is that if we could be forewarned about something, we could know how to handle it. One of the things that I find really incredible about the Bible is, is that when you study it, you find out that it is full of time. T-I-M-E. One of the things that I see in this text is that the time that we're talking about is God's time or his time. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we knew what God had planned for each of us? Wouldn't it be magnificent if we could just say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to go do this, tomorrow I'm going to do that, I'm going to live forever, etc. We are not privy to that. It, I find it that, that these disciples have come to Jesus and their interest is Remember now, they're talking to the one who just went to the cross some 40 days before this. They're talking to someone who has been resurrected from the dead. They're talking with Jesus, who they spent all those three years with, and their only question with him is, are you going to put things right with the nation right now? So... They're saying, what time frame do you have for everything playing out here? When I was growing up, and I'll see if anybody grew up when I grew up, there was a television program on, and, and the announcer would say, and you can talk to me, you can talk to this preacher. If I ask a question, you give me an answer. So the announcer said, hey kids, what time is it? I knew I had the right crowd. <laughs> you also told your age, you know. That was like the Sunday school lesson this morning. Joseph who? You know, well, howdy doody who? Well, I want you to know that in this text, it's his time. But I find confusion when I see... This time, you're in verse 6. Lord, at this time, 
will you restore the kingdom of Israel. This time. See, they really want to know, is it going to happen right now? This time. Would you be asking God, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, if he's going to restore the government today at this time? Wouldn't it have been just enough to have been with Jesus? Wouldn't you have been happy being with Jesus? This time, this time they should have been saying to themselves, this is marvelous, here's my Savior. I've ministered with him for three years. I've been with him for three years. I've watched him minister. I I was there when he preached the Sermon on the Mount. I watched his miracles. Wouldn't it have been enough for you to see Jesus do his miracles? They watched him heal the lame and the blind and the sick. He watched him raise the dead. And in all of that, that's not enough. They want to know about the government of Israel. They're the same bunch that at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper was arguing who would be the number one big shot in the kingdom of God while Jesus, intertwined in all of that conversation, is trying to tell them he's about to die. And they were so wrapped up in that he was going, that, that somebody was going to sit at his right hand that they missed totally that he was going to be crucified, resurrected. Somehow I guess they're much like us. We know what we're supposed to do. We know how we're supposed to be. We know what life is all about, basically. We know that when we're with Jesus, we ought to be still and quiet. But yet we're not, are we? We're asking stupid questions like, when's my next meal coming? Or who's going to pay the insurance bill? Or, hmm? Shouldn't it be enough just to be with Jesus? Why would it be that we say, at this time, Lord, will you take care of all my needs and wants and some of those other things that I'd like to have at this time? They're saying to Jesus at this time, my concern is national reformation. When in fact, what they should have been asking him them for, him for, is for personal transformation. One of the things that we confuse ourselves with all the time is is that Jesus is a God of the gimmies. And he's not. He does, but he's not that kind of a God that is, give me this and give me that. How many of you ever pray a gimme prayer? Don't raise your hand. About my relationship with him and ask that he show me the ministry that he has for me. Ask me to be a part of any healing that he's going to be involved in. But we kind of just drift through life and this time comes and goes. Notice in verses, verse 8, that was 6 and 7. In verse 8 you need to notice that Jesus is talking about the meantime. They're concerned about the this time. Jesus has some orders for them, and he says, he talks about the meantime. He says, what you need to do is to wait for the power to come to you, and after you receive it, you need to use it to change the world. You need to go into Judea, Jerusalem, the uttermost parts of the world. So the text says, basically, that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, 
and in the rest of the world. Well, they wanted to know about restoration of the government. They were not interested necessarily in transformation of the world. You need to praise God, however, because they did what they were supposed to do, and they set out to win the world to Jesus. And the result is, is that here we are today, many of us born-again believers, because of Jesus Christ's crucifixion, resurrection on the cross. And because those little men in that upper room decided they'd wait for power. Now, for those of us who are born again, that power isn't coming someday. Because when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit in power at that very moment. You didn't wait for baptizing. It happened when you said yes to Jesus. Power. In the meantime, take this power and use it to witness to the whole world. Incredible. He promised them success in whatever they would do that fit his plan. I want you to know you have that same success available to you because you have that same power. You have the power to be the greatest soul winner in the world, all you have to do is use the power. Is that right? That's right? We don't. Your next verse says something like this. He suddenly starts rising. That means his feet leave the ground. We're not talking about G-forces. We're talking about God-forces. We're talking about he's being taken up into heaven, out of their sight. They'd just been asking for, hey, when are you going to put Israel back together? And here he is, he says, you've got power, go get it, and watch me go. And here he goes, he rises up, up, out of sight. If I had been there, I would have probably been standing there with my lower lip on the ground. Actually, let me give you a nickel's worth of translation or paraphrase. Two men clothed in white stand there and look at these disciples and says to them, what are you standing there with your mouths open for? That's not what your Bible says, but that's what I read. Why stand you gazing into the sky or into the heavens The way you see him go is the same way you're going to see him come back. He demonstrated the power that he had already promised them that he could have, that they could have, and that same power that he used to to levitate or to leave this world for heaven, he gave you too. Now, I don't see anybody lifting off. But that power will certainly give you the ability to do what he wants you to do any time you start listening to him. See, Jesus is always talking to you in a still, small voice. You know, the problem with us is to, our voice is always louder than his. Wouldn't it be great if you could hear Jesus speak to you? You know the best way to hear somebody talk? Shut up. That's Greek, in case you wondered. I use that along with the other Greek word, baloney, sometimes. So you have the his time, which includes this time, and the mean time, and you just heard the end time. Because what you see there is is that as I would have seen him go, I will see him come again. So if I could tell you 
and forewarn you and ask you to get prepared, consider that I'm doing that right now. Because Jesus is coming again. Now, some of you are already prepared. You got a paid up policy. Jesus paid it all. Some of you have said yes to Jesus for Lord and Savior in your life, and you're living the best way you know how for Him. He's come into your life. You're using it to direct your family. You're using it to, to be a total part of what everything, everything that you do. Some of you have not done that yet, and some of you need to do that today. But I'm here to tell you that what you need to do to prepare for Jesus' coming is to not say, oh well, I'll wait for a better forecast. I want you to prepare right now. Number one, Christians, listen to me. Look busy. Jesus is coming. Look busy. Jesus is coming. Those of you who are not born again believers need to recognize that their time is this time, meantime, end time, sign of the times. In Revelations chapter 1, verse 7, what you see is this. The Bible says that he's coming again. It describes it graphically that he's on his way. And you can picture that what it says is that everybody, living and dead, will see him coming. He's coming again. Soon. Jesus was visiting the temple in Matthew chapter 24. He leaves the temple and tells some of his disciples that uh, this beautiful building is going to be destroyed. There won't be a rock left standing. So, about verse 3, Matthew 24, they secretly sneak up to him in private. And they ask for the sign of the time. Tell us how things are going to be. Give me a better forecast because I didn't like the last one. You're coming back. I heard that, but I didn't understand it. So try to explain it a little more. And so for the entire most of chapter 24 of Matthew, Jesus explains signs of the time, of the end time. Now listen to me carefully because this is what you have to hear. In Matthew 24, verse 25, Jesus says, See, I have already told you. Your King James Version says something like, uh, I, I told you so, something to that effect. So this morning I stand here and tell you that if you're not born again believer, whether you're going to be living or dead when he comes, you're going to see him come. And I'm asking you to prepare now, today, at this time to meet him as your Lord and Savior, not as one who won't know you. So if you're a Bible reader and you have read your Bible, or someone said Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, he tells you he's coming again, and then in verse 25 he tells you, I told you so. You all know what that means, don't you? then he's coming again, and he's going to do it in his time. And when he does, it'll be this time. In the meantime, you can either be saved or lost, and you can look for all the signs you want. I just gave you one. But I think what we need to deal with today, right now, is the on time. Because today is the accepted day of salvation. Some of you are in need of just 
speaking with the Lord. Some of you need to say, this time, Lord, I'm ready to listen. This time, Lord, I'm not concerned about nationalism. I'm concerned about my transformation. This time, Lord, I want to listen for what you have to say to me. Some of you need to say, I'm ready to become a disciple of Jesus Christ and not ask stupid questions like they did. You will, but that's okay. He's been listening to my stupid questions a long time, so yours couldn't be any worse than mine. But the on time is right now. There is no better time to follow Jesus, whether you've been a follower for a while or whether you need to start following him. On time is right now. If I were to ask you, will you at this time become part of God's kingdom? That requires an answer. His kingdom is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? His time. This time, meantime, end time, sign of the times. It's time for the on time. We need to get back involved with his church, doing what he's called us to do if we're born again believers. He called us to lead people to Jesus. If we're not born again, we need to become so. And today, right now, when we sing a hymn of invitation, just as I am, is the moment when you need to come down the aisle, take my hand and tell me you want to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Others of you may want to join this church fellowship. It's fantastic. We, Kay and I, searched long and hard for church. I'm picky. I was looking for a good preacher. I was looking for a fellowship in a Sunday school class, people that would love me with all my warts. This is the place, if God's calling you to be born again, this is the place to be saved. If God's calling you to become part of this fellowship, this is the place. And you need, to be, you need to be on time, which means when we hear that first note, you need to leave that pew and come down here and tell me what God's leading you to do. Some of you may be being led oh, to finally do what he's been calling you to do. Let me give you a commercial before I quit. You thought that was the invitation. It is. Many of us wrestle with demons in our lives. Many of us have addictions and problems and difficulties. Many of us have health situations that we can't overcome. Many of us just go through life sometimes and just wonder what it's all about. Some suffer from depression. Some suffer from too many pills. Some suffer from family. Family will kill you. It'll drive you crazy. Because you struggled through your life as family and then all of a sudden family's there and they're struggling and you can't do a thing about it. Tonight we're going to discuss the rules for giant killing. Tonight we're going to come prepared to kill some giants in our lives. This is not an exercise we're going to do. This is going to be an exorcism. I am not preaching tonight on a healing process. I am not going to lay hands on you tonight, but I am going to tell you how to get rid of the giant in your life. And if you listen to the Lord as we go through the process this evening, you will be able to rid yourself of that burden you've been carrying too long. Would you stand with me, please? Now let's pray. 
Almighty Father, we have done this on your time. We have looked to you for guidance and help and strength. We've preached your word. We have reached into hearts and spoken to them. We've let your spirit permeate this place. We would pray, Lord, this morning that decisions will be made that are appropriate. Decisions about rededication of renewal of our lives that we're going to actually give to you for a change. Decisions for being born again. Life-changing, transforming decisions. We're going to be making decisions of this is the place to worship the true and living God. So now I pray for each of these that are standing. Lord, whatever their decision, I pray that if it's to be public, that they'll do that today. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.